Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It gives me great pleasure to welcome Miriam Frank, a singer and a musicologist. She's currently studying at Royal Holloway at the University of London and doing a dissertation on Simlinski with Julian Johnson. She's performed throughout Europe and Asia with the Arnold Schoenberg Choir and has done uh, solo recitals in Europe and the United States at New York University and the Bohemian National Hall. She has a recital at Royal Holloway forthcoming in March. As a scholar, she's published articles in Musicologica Olomantia on subjects related to this event, an article called The Lullaby of Ilse Weber, and recently co-authored an article on the cunning little vixen for the Glyndebourne program book. She's given lectures and lecture recitals in the United States, England, and the Czech Republic. And this afternoon, she's offering a lecture recital titled What's the Backstory Anyway? Give her a warm welcome, please. Good afternoon, everybody. I hope you're still awake. Welcome to take a nap, too, if you like. Um, I would like to thank you all for coming, and it's great to be here, um, especially also outside, nice and warm. It looks a bit different right now in England. Um, I'd also like you to welcome Tali Tatmore, who will be playing for me now, and also later tonight in the recital, or concert, rather, which I hope you'll all attend. Um, so, I'd like to begin with an anecdote of an experience Schoenberg had at a recital of Schubert songs. I must admit that I cannot prove it ever happened this way, but it was one of Nicolaus Hanunkur's favorite tales, and whether he'd done his research or not, but I actually think he has, um, it makes for a good story. So, during that song recital, Schoenberg didn't understand most of the poetry, so I assume he must have been a soprano who was singing. Um, <laughs> but he was immensely touched by it all the same. So he went home and did his research on, on the texts, um, after which he was somewhat disappointed because it didn't provide any more insight into what he had experienced on the evening of the concert. At least that's what he thought. So while I'm certainly not invested or interested in buying into the notion of the sublime power of absolute music, I do think there's some validity to this story of Schoenberg's, especially to us 21st century perfectionists. So today I'm going to speak about backstories, and I assume I'm not the only one here. Um, some may seem less fraught than others. However, when we're dealing with a, you know, whether we're dealing with a Viennese composer in American exile, or a Czech Jew who faced Terezin and ultimately Auschwitz, they all confront us as performers and scholars with a number of questions, some of which we'll explore this afternoon. So what is a backstory anyway, and when can it be useful? A common place for backstories of all kinds, be it song texts, biographies, or information regarding music and composer, are of course program notes or playbills. They help us to understand the music better, they inform us about the backstories, stories, we are told, at the most extreme level, are practically required so as to hear pieces the right way. To be sure, as a performer, I'm certainly curious and even obliged to learn about the circumstances of a given piece, because it might give me clues as to what atmospheres, colors, and details may be hidden between the lines and the note heads on the page. After having obtained that knowledge, I, of course, also have the right to disregard it if, after some assessment, I come to the inclusion that it does not help to add meaning to a piece. But do I also have the right to withhold information if it may be valuable or even essential for an audience to gain a better understanding of the music? Later, we will hear a lullaby that was composed in Terezin. The woman who wrote it happened to live in extraordinarily difficult circumstances, but the same woman also wanted to sing the children she was looking after to sleep. The question now is, do I, in 2016, want to make my audience hear where the song was composed? Or do I want to stay true to the composer's original purpose, so to rock a child to sleep? Or perhaps neither? 
So let's try to look for some answers in my first demonstration involving a set of songs which, because of their backstory, have been somewhat neglected from the legacy of one of the better known composers of the fin du siècle, Alexander Zemlinsky. While the voice of this multifaceted composer has gladly been recovered for quite some time now, I think that his oeuvre has been tailored to more or less fit the late 19th century modernity box. When I started looking at his late songs, I discovered that he was a man of many voices, and indeed some of them are still silent. Zemlinsky wrote his very last songs in exile in New York in 1939. The poetry of the American songs was first written in German by Irma Steinfirner and subsequently translated into English by Alice Matulat. During my research, I found out that Zemlinsky might have been a little ashamed of his attempt to include American, more popular elements in his songwriting. He'd planned to publish under a pseudonym, Al Roberts. Why it didn't happen this way remains unclear. Even more, his second wife, Louise, disowned the songs altogether. In his comprehensive biography, Anthony Beaumont describes Irma Steinfirner's texts as, quote, charming but unremarkable, unquote. While this may be true, I think we all know that even the greatest composers often manage to write rather fine music to mediocre texts. We can have fights about Richard Wagner's text later if somebody wants to. Even some of Richard Strauss' songs are you know, written to rather mediocre poetry. Again, fights later outside. <clears throat> so I'm guessing that these songs didn't quite fit in the legacy of a great European modernist and thus had to disappear somehow. So as a diligent performer, should I refrain from singing these songs since the composer himself may have rejected them? Whose responsibility is it to determine someone's legacy? The immediate families or the biographers? While it's probably safe to say that hardly any artist's complete and collected works are exclusively full of masterworks, I do believe that it's in our interest as curious performers and researchers to take a peek behind the scenes and to question the opinion passed on to us and perhaps even help to unravel old myths. So as you can imagine, I decided to perform the songs, but how? They were obviously an attempt of Zemlinsky's publisher to familiarize a popular, perhaps sort of Broadway audience with the European composer. So um, Telly and I will give you a little, does that come out? Yep. Demonstration of what that could sound like in the second of the three songs. And before you're all worried, you'll hear all of them tonight. So you'll just get very little snippets now. So this is the popular version. Bad weather, we'll be together. I at my ship on the boundless blue sea. So that will be that. But so in, in this short snippet of the song of, of, of the second song of the set, there are indeed some popular elements other than sort of my poor demonstration right now. Zemlinsky uses an augmented dominant triad, G, B, D sharp, in my transposed version here, to both stabilize the third scale degree on which the piece opens and to add a little sort of jazzy dissonance here. Gladly, though, I paid attention in my history of music classes and remember that Zemlinsky really is a composer of true art music. Ah, and someone without whom Schoenberg would have never been able to come up with the invention of 12-tone music. So perhaps then my interpretation of my ship and I, let's put this back here, um, should really more sound like this. Um, yeah, so I guess you notice these two performance options, of course, are rather limited and unimaginative ways of interpreting the songs. They choose one stereotype and stick with it. 
Neither approach may be entirely wrong, but they cease to explore the many colors and even styles inherent to the song. There are elements of pop and jazz, as we heard earlier, but Zemlinski also employs what he's best known for, challenging rhythms and chromaticism, especially in the piano part. And Tally is just going to play a little bit of that, also from the same song, without my singing, because you'll be able to hear better what I mean. Yeah, so that's not so poppy at all, is it? Um, so, and in the third song, which you'll hear tonight, um, we even find changing meters between 4-4 four, four and 3-4 going back and forth, which is nothing that frequently happens in popular music at all, really. So, at the time of composing these songs, Zemlinski had barely even arrived in America. So, he follows in the footsteps of another famous European composer who managed to write an entire American symphony shortly after he'd set foot on American soil, Antonin Dvorak. Just like Dvorak, whose influence came from Czech, German, and African-American backgrounds alike, Zemlinski's makeup was anything but generic. His Germanness, if that's what you want to call it, was Jewish, Christian, Austrian, Czech, Bavarian, and so on and so forth. Thus, the three th songs written in America are Czech, German, Austria, and indeed American. And I'll leave it up to you to discover the sound worlds of, of these different sort of backgrounds in tonight's performance. In my opinion, it's exactly the multi-dimensional quality of pieces like the three songs that make us listen out today, years, decades, and centuries after they were written, perhaps especially today, in times where the Western world order ceases to be stable, and just as hard to define as these songs, perhaps. And I believe that a performance which embraces both old and new world elements, as well as the odd popular perfect, allows for a transparent result. No doubt there are many ways of performing these songs, which to me makes them particularly rich and interesting. So I would now like to reframe the questions I've been asking about backstories in another context one that has become increasingly popular in what I call the war and peace front of music presentation. Unlike the case of Timlinski, where we're dealing with a larger question of what belongs in someone's legacy, these performances make use of backstories in order to direct or even manipulate the audience's emotional response. War, turmoil, peace, hope. These words mean something to everyone and are often associated with strong imageries. At this very moment, we're living in a world that seems to be falling apart. Whether that's true or more of a sentiment co-created by mass media and political maskots is hard to say. But the contrasts of extreme poverty and turmoil on the one hand, and our first world obsession with economic expansion on the other hand, have indeed created unbridgeable gaps. These gaps have been picked up on by both clever marketing people and sensitive artists alike. And the amount of energy devoted to presenting musical images related to war and turmoil is hard to overlook. These efforts consisting of websites, CD releases, and social media blasts often invoke refugees, soldiers, children, battles, and of course, the Holocaust. There's a wide spectrum of projects, some of them created with great artistry and high sensitivity to the subject matter. Others, I'm afraid, merely ride the wave, a rather tasteless undertaking, I believe, in order to catch audiences and to draw attention to their own person. In these cases, the performer often is portrayed as a kind of hero who somehow feels he or she can warn the world. And I'd like to have that image up now, please. Mm. Yeah, so um, this is all PowerPoint you're going to get from me. So <laughs> this, is, uh, this is basically just a little collage of, of what I, I was just talking about. I'll leave it up to you to make up your minds about whether, you know, which ones are the more and which ones are the less successful ones, I think. You can, also t you can already tell by the cover. Um, and they're all fairly recent, recent releases, some of them even this year couple or three. Just let that sit. 
I'm not going to comment, but you, you can look it up and make up your mind. Okay, thank you. So in order to clarify what I mean with all this, I prepared a couple of examples. Tally and I will play you two versions of Ilse Weber's song, Wiegela. We'll play them both in succession without much explanation between them, and then you'll see. The miracle of art happened when there was no hope left. This little song survived. A tune composed by Ilse Weber in the midst of chaos. She sang it with the children in Terezin. She sang it with them even as they were sent to Auschwitz. This little lullaby is still here with us today when we say no. Never again. Let's now see what we really know about the piece and how that might help us to create a sensible and sensitive performance. So first of all, the hard fact. Ilse Weber was born a German-speaking Jew in what's now the Czech Republic in 1903. She was married and had two children, Hanusz and Tommy. She wrote poetry and played music, most likely on an amateur level. One of her poems is titled Wiegela, what we just heard, and it is fairly certain that she also wrote the melody. There are a number of published arrangements, but it is not clear whether any of these were written by Weber herself. Ilse, her husband, and Tommy were sent to Terezin, where she worked at the sick ward for children. She died together with her son Tommy in Auschwitz in 1944. Weber's husband and her eldest son Hanusz, who had been sent to Sweden as a young child, survived the war. Hanush chose to donate Ilse's Terezin papers to Yad Vashem in Israel. So, speculative bits of information. Ilse played the lute. She wrote and arranged the two songs. No, one song, sorry. When she was sent into the gas chambers together with Tommy and other children, she sang her song, Vigala, a lullaby with them. These are things we hear, but we don't know whether they're true or not. So, as you probably have noticed, we tried to make you hear the ghetto background in our second attempt. Not so successful, but you know. Telly and I did our best to create an atmosphere of darkness and hopelessness. One could say that we really did our homework and included just about everything we could in our performance. Ilse Weber's text and tune as well as the history of it. 
And because we wanted to demonstrate the most shocking circumstances to our audience, we used the speculative bits of information. In this version, we tell you that Ilse Weber indeed sang Wiegela in the gas chambers of Auschwitz, a story that appears, for example, in the liner notes of Deutsche Grammophon album. I've frequently seen it presented as a historical fact in various performances featuring songs from the camps, and it's effective. So in our first performance, we try to stick with what's on the page, I mean, minus the arrangement, because that's not clear, but... And we thought we'd present the song as a lullaby, since that was most likely its initial purpose. After all, it was meant to be for children. If anything, it was meant to help them forget about their worries for a while. I don't think our second attempt would have achieved that. Thus, not only is it difficult to assess what exactly the backstories of a piece are, but even more so how to treat them and whether it makes sense to make them audible. Different ways of performing simple twos can, as we just saw, significantly influence the atmosphere and sentiment of a song. And even without the sentimental introduction I gave, which, by the way, I haven't made up, the second example we played would have managed to convey a rather depressing mood. However, I do believe that we can determine with some certainty that this second example never existed in Terezin, and that such a performance, which I said I came across recently, may well serve the purpose of creating some moral high ground for both audience and performer alike. While it incorporates all kinds of background information about the ghetto, the performance chooses to use it in a way that is neither sensitive nor helpful to give the audience an idea of who Ilse Weber might have been and why she wrote her songs. Perhaps even just for pure entertainment. And while I'm certainly no defender of accurate historical performance practice, so in this case of trying to recreate what Terezin may have sounded like, I oppose an approach that abuses the fraught context of a piece for some easily triggered sentimental reactions. I believe that the strength of the pieces we looked at today lies in their ability to express and move in the moment now in 2016 and not in an attempt to explain or even excuse history. As we can see, it is very tricky to create a historically informed yet sensitive performance of a piece composed in fraud circumstances. Nonetheless, I think there are a few questions every performer should ask him or herself when encountering the music. Do I really want to trigger emotional reactions by pointing out the Theresien or Auschwitz stories? What about the speculative bits of information? Is it morally acceptable to even mention them? Is it my job as a performer to make audiences aware of Ilse's destiny? so to enlighten them about the legacies of the song, or should I convey the music in its purity? The good news is that I have no singular answers to any of the above. But I still hope that my demonstrations have made it clear that the kind of approaches that take the backstory seriously instead of exploiting them have a better chance of being successful. In general, I think there's one rule of thumb that actors and singers learn quite early in the game. And I think it can help to keep any kind of performance within healthy boundaries. Never perform the reaction or the effect that's left to the audiences. Thank you. Time for a few questions, comments? No. More singing. <laughs> Tonight there'll be more, much more. <laughs> yes, please. How might we handle the treatment of uh, First Nations or Native American uh, musical traditions which were taken down by like uh, Elise Fletcher uh, initially and retranscribed into Western tonalities, and then when the New Age came around and we had modern technologies, which are a part of our musical history now, uh, everything started having synth and flute, where not every tradition had flute in it, for example. How might we treat that kind of uh, reproduction of those music? 
I mean, I think that's an interesting question. I have absolutely no authority, I think, to comment on the subject because I'm, I mean, you know, I'm from England. I don't, <laughs> I don't know anything about, um, unfortunately, about Native American music. But I think, um, you know, why use a different kind of approach? I think, you know, go back and, and look at what you have, evaluate it. Because, you know, also some of the work that's, that might have been done afterwards, it's not all bad. That's something we assume that everything people did afterwards is just, must necessarily be bad, you know? I mean, what, what I heard, for, for instance, just going back to my example, the song that I, the lullaby I was singing, there are tons and tons and tons of different recordings out there. And one of them does exactly what's on the page, only singing the melody in a really, really eerie way. You know, it's nice to have an accompaniment, and I think there's no problem about making up some things as, as long as you're not as long as you don't pretend you're, you, you know, you're doing the only right thing with it. You know, I think there are multiple approaches, really. Well, I'm going to ask just quickly about this Tembinski song. Um, so, what was the idea of the publisher? Do we know anything about how he was going to... I mean, here he has this possibly famous composer, and yet he's going to publish under a pseudonym. Uh, do you have an idea of what was yeah. supposed to happen? So um, what, I, what I read, I mean, it's really difficult because I don't know where the manuscripts are of these songs. They're not in the Library of Congress with all the other stuff. Um, as far as I'm aware, he, he was supposed to publish under a pseudonym because they were trying to figure out how the audience would respond. And then afterwards, sort of, you know, releasing more of that stuff with his name on it. It was sort of a, I think it was a trial. I don't know what your pilot project, I don't know. Anything more? All right, well, thank you very much.